For the Enlightenment, the medievals had no choice but to use their imaginations to make sense of the world around them. Because of the enormous influence that the church held over their daily lives, anything that could not be explained was seen as either sinister or magical. Some of their strange and often ridiculous superstitions are what we're going to talk about in today's video. Welcome to Medieval Madness. The Feast of Fools This festival was held on the day of the circumcision, on the 1st of January, especially in France, and celebrated the biblical principle that God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. A pretend pope or bishop was elected, church rituals were mocked, and those in lower positions changed places with those in high. It could be seen as a small social revolution, where power and the freedom to do as one pleased was given to the underlings. During the festival, participants would wear masks and dress in women's clothing. They would get drunk and sing obscene religious songs, throw dung at passers-by, leap about the church, and replace the word Amen in fake ceremonies by making silly noises. Please pause the video and make some silly noises. Despite numerous attempts to ban the festival in 1431, the feast didn't die out until much later in the 16th century. Lucky Horseshoes they were considered lucky in the Middle Ages because they were thought to ward off evil. Horseshoes were also made of iron, and the metal itself was thought to repel bad spirits. In the 10th century, Bishop Saint Dunstan was considered to be England's favourite saint, until Thomas A. Becket came along in the 12th century. It was said that when Dunstan worked as a blacksmith, Satan came into his shop one day. Dunstan pretended that he didn't know the devil, and continued to shoe his horse. But instead of nailing the shoes to the horse, he nailed them to old Nick himself. The devil was in agony. But Dunstan would only agree to remove the shoes if Satan promised never to step over the threshold of a house with a horseshoe on the door ever again. Although there were rules involved if the protection was going to work, the horseshoe had to be made from iron and have fallen off a horse on its own, and not be deliberately removed. And it had to be fixed over the door with iron nails. Contraception. The idea that all medievals abided by canon law and only had sex to procreate is just not realistic. Many engaged in extramarital and other forms of sex that were regarded as sinful, but they did have some strange ideas when it came to contraception. As well as using mixtures of vinegar and honey, other spermicides included animal dung. Another method involved carrying the womb of a goat, which has never given birth against your naked flesh. Or how about catching a male weasel, castrating it before releasing it back into the wild, and then tying the testicles into a goose skin before carrying them around next to your bosom. Pop goes the weasel's testicles. Perhaps you would prefer a charm made from the dung of a mule, or its earwax, or maybe its uterus. If all else fails, you could always take the bone from the right side of an all-black cat and strap it to your thigh. As far as condoms were concerned, pretty much anything could be turned into a wrapper, Animal intestines or bladders were popular, and you could even use a tortoise shell if you were really stuck. Perhaps it would have been easier and less painful just to remain celibate. Birth Rituals In the Middle Ages, being pregnant was a dangerous time. If the mother and baby came out of the experience alive, they were considered lucky. A lack of medical knowledge meant that 20% of mothers died during childbirth, and a third of all children were dead before their fifth birthday. The medievals had a range of remedies to help increase the chances of a successful birth. Anything that could symbolise a closed womb was removed from the home. Knots were untied, cupboard doors were left ajar, prayers were offered up to Saint Margaret, who had been lucky enough to get herself spat out of the mouth of a dragon. Birth girdles were worn, which were made from strips of parchment displaying prayers and charms. Gemstones such as amber or jade might be placed on the girdle after first being put between the mother's thighs to alleviate her pain. Coriander was applied on her thighs to attract the baby, and poultices made from rose water and eagle dung were also rubbed there to ease the pain. And even after a safe birth, the rituals continued. The umbilical cord was burned to get rid of any sin transmitted at the time of conception. If only it was that simple. Then, herbs would be used to get the baby to sneeze and expel any left sin inside the child. 
Finally, the baby's tongue was rubbed with vinegar to guarantee that the baby would eventually speak. Of course, it's impossible to know if any of these practices worked. So please leave a comment below if you've ever rubbed a woman's legs with eagle dung while she's in labour to see if it's made a difference. Changelings Stories about changelings were very common through the Middle Ages. Many people believed that, for whatever reason, a child that was unusual in some way was actually a creature rather than a human baby. More often than not, the changeling referred to a fairy that had been swapped for a mortal child. The human baby is taken to the fairy kingdom to work for them, and the creature that has been left in its place would sicken and die. They may live into adulthood, but are always considered to be strange by the local villagers or townsfolk. One tale about a changeling involves a blacksmith who one day noticed that his son had become listless and was wasting away. He was told that his son had been swapped for a changeling. To prove this, he had to take empty eggshells, fill them with water, and place them all around the fire. Suddenly, the baby sat up and speaking in the voice of the changeling, which I'm going to try and recreate, said, I have lived for centuries, and I have never seen anything like that. The blacksmith quickly snatched up the changeling and threw it into the fire. Then he went to the realm of the fairies with his bible. The fairies were unable to harm him, and he was able to retrieve his totally not burnt to a crisp son and return home. Other methods to recover a lost infant included beating the false baby in the hope that its cries would bring the fairies back to rescue their brethren and return the real human child, leaving them exposed in the woods for the fairies to reclaim them, or to be eaten by animals, or even drowning them were alternative techniques. For those parents who preferred not to batter their child senseless, they might choose to frighten the fairy away by threatening to scold it in the soup kettle, or scorch it with a red-hot poker. The hope was that the changeling would be coaxed out and persuaded to leave through fear. There were other tests that people could do to see whether their child was a changeling or not. Typically, this involved performing some particularly strange practice to surprise the changeling and draw it out. Making the fake baby laugh seemed to be the preferred method. Apparently, this could be achieved by placing a shoe in a bowl of soup or by making bread inside of eggshells. The easy-to-please mind of a child. The likelihood is sadly that the medievals used the idea of changelings to explain away a child's behavioural problems if they had disabilities, autism, or other neurodevelopmental disorders. Changes can happen quite quickly as the child grows and learning difficulties take hold. In fact, any sign of a defect could be taken as an indication that a fairy had swapped their child. Saying God bless after a sneeze. This custom is believed to have started very early in the Middle Ages, during the 6th century. At the time, the bubonic plague was spreading across Europe, ravaging the people, including those in the papal city of Rome. It was believed that sneezing left the body vulnerable, making it easier for the devil to enter a person and possess them. There was also a popular belief that a person could actually sneeze out their soul. The idea dates back to the Bible. When God made Adam in his own image, he breathed life into his body. The rapid expulsion of air made during a sneeze was thought to be the person's life being ejected from them. The idea being that a person's breath and their soul were the same thing. So, Pope St. Gregory the Great issued a papal decree that required all Christian people to say the phrase, God bless you, as a way of exorcising Satan and preparing them for a good death by keeping the soul in. There was little else that people could do at the time to halt the spread of the illness, but this was one way for them to at least feel helpful. In France and England, yawning was also thought to be an opportunity for the devil to get inside a person, and people were told to cover their mouths when they felt the need to yawn. In Ireland, the sign of the cross was made over the mouth when yawning. The Dagendorf Pilgrimage Anti-Semitism thrived in the Middle Ages, and the small city of Dagendorf in Germany demonstrated this in a horrible way. The myth began in 1337, when the Jews of Dagendorf convinced a good Christian woman to steal bread for the Holy Communion so that they could desecrate it. But supposedly a miracle occurred, and Jesus, along with the Virgin Mary, appeared, and the bread was returned, and so the Jews had to be killed. The truth is that there had been a series of crop failures in the region, leaving the city in economic crisis. 
The entire Jewish population were used as scapegoats and were burned so that the Christians could steal their property and possessions. The myth about the bread was just a story made up to justify the massacre and assuage the residents' guilt. But the carnage at Dagendorf sparked off persecutions in the surrounding area and made the city's church a pilgrimage site, attracting Catholics and bringing in a major source of regular income to the city. It took until 1992 for the church to remove everything that had been associated with the massacre. Although many of the ideas of the medievals seemed like harmless nonsense, it is also true that many injustices and deaths occurred because of some of their misguided beliefs and superstitions. The lives of most Europeans involved belief in the supernatural and magic. For most medievals, the challenge was to be able to exert some form of influence over the things that they perceived to be evil, because they didn't understand them. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. Please do subscribe to the channel if you enjoy the content, and we'll see you next Friday for another video. Cheers!